I'll first give you some preliminaries about how I got involved with this uh, 1603 map many years ago. I'll talk about some sources and the problems we encounter in evaluating them. We'll then focus uh, in all seriousness on this map and try to decode it, the various stages of the uh, three-day battle that took place. And then we will ask ourselves a couple of basic questions, the what, the when, and the why it even happened. We will then turn to look at the short and long-term repercussions, and then we will ask ourselves at the end that very important question, well, so what? Yeah? Why should I care about any of this? Is this even important? Let me first talk to you about my involvement with the 1603 map. It was a number of years ago, uh, probably at least one and a half decades, and this would probably take us back to the 19, late 1990s and early 2000s. I was presented by a, a colleague uh, a grainy picture of uh, the map that you have just seen before, and which we will see in a moment again. And I was asked, do you have any clue what this is? And I said, no, I don't, off the bat, I can't say. But what really intrigued me about it is that there was a box with text in it, and it was written in German. And I said, now that is interesting. A text in German, where does it come from? and what does it represent? Now, this was at a time when I knew very little about Singapore in this period uh, of the 16th and 17th centuries. Of course, that has considerably changed since then. And when I was looking for the text in the background, I was looking mainly at the immediate context and the immediate source from where it was coming from. I did eventually track it down. At that time, I found it in three different versions in the State Library in Munich, in Germany. And I wrote it in an article which was then uh, finished in June 2001 and published uh, two years later. Sixteen years and a couple of hundred documents later on. I, of course, have a much clearer picture of what is happening. And I've seen it now from different sides as well, not just the Dutch sources, but also the, the Portuguese sources and others. And there are lots of problems and challenges. And maybe if I can just spend five minutes of your time to explain just how tricky this period in history really is, to give you an appreciation of the challenges that are at hand in evaluating sources uh, from this period. First of all, you have to be able to read the handwriting. Paleography is a main skill for anybody working on this period. And paleography is the art of deciphering old handwritings. Handwritings were very regional and very local, and it takes a long time to get used to a particular handwriting uh, from a, a certain area. Then you're dealing with languages that hadn't fully developed yet. The vernaculars don't have the same rules of grammar and punctuation as they do now. And the people who were writing them were rarely highly educated. Every now and then, you get all excited because you actually have a document that is written by somebody who was highly educated. Yeah, I just had one last week. It was written by a Jesuit. And all I can say is what a pleasure to read for a change. It's written in a neat hand, and the punctuation is more or less accurate as we would use it now. What you're looking at normally are people who had some education. They probably wouldn't have gotten much beyond what we would call primary six today. There was, of course, no official school system in those days. And if you had the privilege of actually being able to read and write, you were from a better or well-off family. But the problem is that most of these people only had a very basic command of the language. They have no clue about punctuation or capitalization or grammar. 
And so what you have are what I would call two different types of characters underlying these documents. The first is what I would call the enthusiastic six-year-old coming back from the zoo. They went on a field trip in school, and you ask the kid at the end of the day, so did you have a good time? What did you see? Oh, oh, yeah, oh, and we saw this, and we saw that, and oh, and, and then we had ice cream, and then we went to the tigers, or, you know, and then you're like, oh, yeah, okay, you had a good time. Huh? It's pearls on a string connected with and, and then we did this, and then this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And this. It's just the sequence, no, no particular depth whatsoever in their analysis. The enthusiastic six-year-old. The second type is the detached teenage girl, also going to the night safari with a school excursion. And she comes home and you said, so how was it? Yeah, it was okay. Did you see anything? Yeah. What did you see? Critters. Did you like them? Yeah, they were okay. What kind of critters did you see? Oh, big ones, small ones, furry ones. Some lived in water. The otters were really cute. The otters were really cute. That is the only statement you're going to get out of this. Yeah? The otters were really cute. And otherwise it was, yeah, well, it was okay. Yeah, it was all right. Yeah? Because on their excursion, they're mainly, at that age, interested in themselves, in each other, and she was probably ogling the boys as well. And the zoo, that was just some sort of a, a stage in the background that she may or may not have noticed. And that's how the sources are too, yeah? They're mainly interested in themselves, what they were doing, what their friends were doing, what the other people in their company were doing, and, you know, it's just sort of, yeah in a landscape where you've got critters and other people. You don't know much about these other people, and frankly, they don't say much about them. Now, just imagine that you're crazy enough to be like me, and 400 years later, in the year 2417, you're taking these reports by your six-year-old enthusiastic boy and your detached young teenage daughter and you're trying to do the layout of the night safari based on these testimonies and you're going to pull your hair in sheer despair because these documents aren't really saying what you would like them to. Yeah? And, and this is really the uphill battle that we face today. Yes, we finally found a document that touches on this region in the world, and you sit down and you read it, and it yields nothing really tangible. It's difficult to decode. So this is the problem we face. The other one is that if you have a printed source like the one where this particular map will then come from. If you have that printed source, it may have been tinkered with because publishers already in those days thought, ah, oh, this is really not up to it. You know, we need to, we need to stick something in there that will, you know, sell copies. Yeah. So they will pinch bits and pieces from other testimonies and they will insert them there to kind of well, for the lack of a better word, sex it up a bit, huh? Make it a bit more interesting so they can sell more copies. And sort of peeling away these inserts that don't belong there is sometimes a very difficult task for the printed text. So these are our problems. One, the six-year-old enthusiast who has just an account with no depth and connects everything with and then, and then, and then. The detached observer who really is only interested in what they're doing and their friends are doing and the immediate setting is pretty much irrelevant. And the third one is somebody who comes and tinkers with the text because they want to make it more interesting. So here we are, back to the 1603 map with the German box insert that caught my attention back then uh, at the turn of the millennium. 
This is really the key to decoding what is happening on this map. And it is written in German. And the legend begins with uh, the text I translate from German, the reconstruction of the battle which the Dutch fought against the Portuguese in the Batusawa River. Now, Batusawa was the capital of Johor at the time. It wasn't called Johor River. It was called the Batusawa River. But you've got to know that first. And it reads a bit like a comic strip. You read it from left to right. The stages of the battle, when you read the text, you will see that it takes first place just around where Johor Lama is, a bit upstream from Tekong. Then it moves out towards just across from Changi, and then the ships are heading out toward Pedro Branca. And in the third phase, they're off the northern coast of Bata, basically. The Portuguese are sitting there in shallow waters. So it reads like a comic strip, huh? a sequence of events on a single drawing. This is not a scientific map. It's a sketch. It's a visual aid. That's all it intends to do. A bit like when you make a drawing for your friend to find the party, yeah? where you say, OK, you come here, and then, then you turn left when you see this tree, and then you'll see a house. Yeah? or when your kid draws a treasure map for you. That's the sort of thing. Yeah? It's a visual aid, but it's not meant to be scientific at all. And yet, there are recognizable features of Singapore on here. There are exaggerated and decorative features on here. Uh, particularly, for example, if you look on the top right-hand corner, you see an oversized Pedra Branca. And then next to it, you see a mountain called Bintat. So that's a sort of the Gunung Bintan that is there. It's not supposed to be the island. It's simply a visual aid. From there, you can see the particular hill. The toponyms that you have on the map, so the place names or the things that are written out in text, you can only really understand and appreciate if you have the text to guide you through, because they are based on that particular text. They are not normal place names that we would conventionally use. This is, for example, the case with uh, something called Falsch Singapura, the wrong Singapore. Well, they were looking for the strait, the old strait of Singapore between Sentosa and Harbour Front. That's where the old strait was. And they didn't have a very experienced pilot with them. And they couldn't find the entrance. And so they're getting in smaller boats and they're going around to find their way through the islands. And they go too far south. They head out there toward the north of Bata, uh, probably around Mapor, somewhere around like that. And they come back and they say, oh, there's nothing there and the water's really shallow, it's dangerous to go there. And then some fishermen show up and then they say, oh, no, 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 you're all wrong, you know, it's much further up here. So that's when they then find their way. So you will only understand this false Singapore, the wrong strait of Singapore, when you know the background to the text. That is not the actual place name. The other thing that is really interesting about this map is the mix of place names. Some are in German, some are in Dutch, and some are in Spanish. And this raises the question of what this map actually represents other than a sketch, and what the source of this might have been. It appears to be drawn um, on the basis of a map that pre-existed, and then they may have brought in other information from other pieces of cartography. In other words, what you have here is a bit like a collage eh? taken from, from, from different sources and put together. And the original is probably now lost. We only have this printed edition. So it represents a visual aid to help you visualize the sequence that happened and how tricky the situation was here battling between two European parties in the Straits. Who is fighting whom? This is a battle between the Portuguese and the Dutch in the year 1603. 
The leader of the Dutch side, a uh, certain Jakob Peters von Enkhausen, uh, had just been made vice admiral a few months before he showed up in these waters. His predecessor, a man by the name of Sebald de Wert, had been assassinated in Salon in June, uh, early June 1603. So just a few months earlier, he had been selected among the other officers as the new vice admiral. On the Portuguese side, the commanding officer is a man by the name of Estevão Tejera de Macedo. He is known from Portuguese sources to have been the captain of the fortress, the Portuguese fortress, on the island of Ambon, which would then two years later fall to the Dutch in 1605. Estevão Tejera de Macedo makes another appearance uh, about 10 years later. In some of the documents that I've been recently working with, he's also uh, being mentioned. So he must be based somewhere here in the region, possibly in Malacca itself. How many ships are at stake? On the Dutch side, there are three. Three vessels from the Dutch Blue Water Fleet. So these are ships that had actually come from Europe. There are two medium-sized vessels and one small one, uh, which in the German description is called a yacht, so a yacht, which is probably a, a small two-masted vessel, not large. Uh, the Portuguese side has two carracks or galleons. We're not sure what type it is. Uh, there was one larger than the other. The flagship is, of course, the larger of the two. And then there's one that's about two-thirds or half the size of the flagship. There are two oared galleys, like you would have in the Mediterranean or from maybe from, you would know, from Roman movies uh, or, or movies about the Romans and the Greeks in ancient antiquity. And then about 20 to 25 smaller local type vessels like a Prahu, uh, local type Asian vessels. So only two large vessels, they would probably have most of the heavy artillery on it. And then the smaller vessels that they used. Um, the, the galleys, of course, are there for, for chasing after uh, pirates and other uh, parties. Well, what can we say about the Portuguese fleet? It's very interesting because when you study this, you say, well, why are they using all these local type vessels? How come they're using all these small craft? The answer is that the Portuguese, who were here for already a hundred years, had adapted themselves to local types of warfare. If you're going to chase the local pirates and your local enemies you know, on the waters around the straits, you probably want to do this in small vessels because the first thing they're going to do if they see a big ship with heavy artillery is they're going to go into shallow water and they're going to go hide in the mangroves and they're going to go up the side branches of the river. And so this is what these small vessels are for. The Portuguese use exactly the same types of vessels as the locals do to go and chase them through the mangroves and up into the side rivers. The galleys are rowed, and they, of course, are very fast in the absence of wind. So these smaller vessels that they have are probably not very well armed. They're light artillery at the most. The only one that really had the heavy artillery are the two galleons and especially the flagship. So you have one big vessel, one small one, and the Dutch have three that are medium-sized and medium-armed. When the Dutch sneak up on the Portuguese uh, on the, around the 9th of October, 1603, they get spotted rather quickly because they're having a hard time getting over the sandbanks and the shoals. Uh, they were not aware of how deep the water was. And when the Portuguese realize this, they decide the next morning that they're really going to head for it. Because with a big vessel, 
with all your artillery on it, moored on the riverbank with all these shoals, you're in pretty big danger of being a sitting duck. And so what they decided to do is they're going to dash for it. And they break through the Dutch lines across and head out further down the river toward the open sea, because that's where you're maneuverable. This maneuver, we're told in the Dutch source, cost a lot of lives on the big Portuguese vessels as they were dashing out uh, toward the sea. The second tactic that the Dutch do is they focus on the flagship because that's the one you want to take out. You want to take out your he the heavy artillery uh, and reduce uh, the potential damage they can do to you because the smaller vessels are not going to be the big dangerous ones. The big dangerous one is the flagship. And what did they do? They shoot into the sails. Uh, because if you tear the sails to shreds, the ship becomes very difficult to maneuver. So phase two takes place in the lower part, uh, probably across from Changi now. And then there is watching there. Um, you can see on, on this map here, there is the... Um, uh, here, please. Here, this, this one here. Okay, that's the Johor Armada. And it's sitting there also in shallow water. The Johor Armada is sitting there on the side. They do not want to get involved whatsoever. They're sitting there and they're watching the other two slug it out with each other. And they're doing so from a safe distance in shallow waters so that they don't get into the crossfires of the artillery power. And this raises a really interesting question. We're not told where this Johor Armada is suddenly showing up from. It doesn't seem to be coming down from the capital, Batu Sawar, down the river at all. So it was somewhere stationed outside the river estuary. And of course, the two logical places that we know from other sources is that they were stationed in Singapore or in Bintan or both, probably Singapore. And it makes sense because they're sitting there off of what would then later be Johor Shoal, which is, I think, now Changi Airport. Huh? They're sitting there in shallow waters, watching in smaller craft from a distance. Where is the story even found? It's found tucked away in a travelogue or a journal by Admiral Webern von Warwijk, who sailed out with eight ships in 1602 and returned gradually um, in, in different parts. Uh, the fleet had been separated after they uh, passed the Cape of Good Hope, the south of Africa. They went to different destinations. The last ships, those that actually did come back, uh, came back in 1607. So all in all, a five-year voyage. But there were two major parts. One part went to Aceh, and the other part went to Ceylon, and later comes through the Singapore Straits. Where is this edition printed? It's printed fairly, fairly soon after the first of the vessels begin to come back. In fact, it is there in 1606 already with another edition appearing in 1607. So the last of the vessels from this fleet hadn't even returned from the East Indies yet. And this book is already being published in German in Frankfurt. There was a German edition came out first, followed by a Latin edition both of them are translated on the basis of a Dutch original by a man 
named M. Gotthard Artus. He was the principal or rector of the Latin school in Danzig, and now would be Poland. He did the German and the Latin translation. This is the title page of the 1606 German edition, the first one. And it's titled, Eighth Voyage of the Dutch to the East Indies. Now, the pictures that we've been looking at, including the maps, are found not in the main text. They're found in an annex. And now this gets a bit tricky here. The annex doesn't appear in all of the editions that I have seen. And it may have been that only the more expensive or deluxe editions of this particular text had the illustration appendix added to it at the end. It is a separate publication, which is appended at the end of the main text. And the interesting thing about it is that it contains images from other voyages as well. So it is not just this particular voyage that they're drawing sketches and illustrations for. It also relates to previous ones. And the particular text here in the, in the title says that it has, um, in addition to uh, maps, bird's eye view of Macau, also what in German says, Die Schlacht am Fluss Batu Sawar, samt kurzer Erklärung, which translates as the battle on the river of Batu Sawar, complete with a short explanation. That short explanation is presumably the text box that you saw uh, earlier, or the box insert. Now, it took me a while to figure out what this was. This appears in the Latin edition or the Latin translation of the text and is actually also part of the same story. This is your sketch or Kodak moment um, at the end of the final battle where the Raja of Johor uh, heads with his personal galley toward the main ship of Vice Admiral Peters to congratulate him on the victory in battle. The Latin caption uh, says, Rex Gurensis quomodo ad navis holandorum profecto sit, or how the king of Johor headed toward the ships of the Hollanders or of the Dutch. And it took me a while to figure out that this Gurensis is in fact Johor in, uh, in the Latin translation. What is interesting about this particular illustration, which appears in this uh, illustrated appendix, is first of all, on the top left-hand side is a land battle. There is no land battle being mentioned at all in the written text. So this is probably purely decorative. Even more enthralling is the town or the city below it or next to the river. And of course, we all get excited about this because, well, after all, we know that the uh, the, the Raja and, and the Johor Armada are sitting there off the eastern coast of Singapore. So, so, so might this be an attempt at depicting Singapore? Again, I suspect that this is uh, just for decorative purposes and does not relate to anything in particular. It is there uh, what you would call, like if you buy an apartment in Singapore, the artist's impression. Hmm? That's right. And, and it's also wonderful, uh, this particular illustration, because, because the Raja and the Vice Admiral are bigger than the other people, which is to show that they're more important, of course. Um, that's why they're oversized. So here we have a couple of more questions that we need to ask. And the next question we need to ask is, well, why on earth is this battling uh, happening at all? The second question we need to ask is, why here? Why at this particular location? And the third one is the one I was 
interested in that question 15 years ago was, well, what is the immediate trigger? The immediate trigger, the bigger context, and why is this happening at all? So concentric circles. On the right, ladies and gentlemen, you have from the German text edition of 1606, the reference to Singapore town and the Straits uh, in the text. Uh, and they also mention here, and I put this in here, the Säule oder Pfeiler, which means the column or the pillar, which refers to the rock formation that used to be there where Labrador Park is today at the western entrance um, to the Old Strait of Singapore between Sentosa and Harbour Front. Why is this battle happening at all? There are two or three big reasons for this. The first big reason is, of course, that there is a union of the two crowns uh, at this point in time. The King of Portugal, since 1581, is also at the same time the King of Spain. And this is a situation that will last until 1639-40, when Portugal then reasserts its independence from the Spanish Habsburg monarchy. The second reason is because the Dutch are fighting a war of independence against the Spanish in Europe. Since the middle of the 16th century, roughly, they are fighting for their independence against Spain. And because the Portuguese now obey the same king as the king of Spain, the war is extended to the Portuguese side as well. And most important of all, they are exporting the war into the colonies. That's really the key here. They are taking the war and they are projecting it into other theaters outside Europe, including, of course, this part of the world. So this is why the Portuguese and the Dutch are at war with each other. Why at this location? The Singapore Straits are already known as a very important nodal point in shipping. In fact, the Singapore Straits, already in pre-colonial times, is seen as the center point of two larger trading areas, the area around the South China Sea and the area around the Bay of Bengal and as an annex to it, the Malacca Straits. And so when you transit through the Singapore Straits, you're transiting between two major trading areas. This is the case in Arabic texts. This is the case in Chinese texts. And of course, the Europeans take over this understanding of the link in the Singapore Straits between the two big maritime regions in Asia. What would happen is that in order to protect the vessels coming from Japan and from China, this is the Portuguese, they would send mobile squadrons at different times to different parts of the Straits. From October to February, March, they're sitting out here in the Singapore Straits, waiting for the vessels to arrive from China, Japan, and destinations in the East in general. And at other parts of the year, during the Southwest monsoon season, they're going up toward the northern end of the Malacca Straits. They're waiting there to receive the ships and then lend them armed or guarded escort to the port of Malacca. This is the point of having the ships here. But in 1603, there is more to it than that. And we will hear why in a moment. But the Portuguese are also imposing a riverine blockade to cut off the capital of Johor and the other upstream towns from commerce in general. But they're there in October. This is taking place, this battle. They're there basically to receive 
the vessels coming in from China and Japan. And of course, to keep the local Johor Armada in check. What's the immediate trigger? The immediate trigger for this are events that took place a couple of months earlier, also off the eastern coast of Singapore, off Changi. This is something that I have worked on uh, before I saw this map. And this is the so-called Santa Catarina incident, very well documented. Uh, 25th of February, 1603. Uh, three ships under Jakob von Heemskerk with the support of their Johor allies attack a Portuguese merchant vessel coming from China. They seize the vessel and the cargo. They put all the people on board on shore and they head off with this cargo. And they go back to Europe and they sell it off as booty of war. And this cargo from the Santa Catarina was so valuable, it was worth three million guilders at the time. That was about half the paid in capital of the Dutch East India Company at that point in time. And the Dutch East India Company was five times the size in terms of paid in capital as its English counterpart, the English East India Company. So you can imagine this was a lot of money. And it doesn't surprise that the Portuguese and the Spanish were not going to take this without contesting it. And the case became very famous because it was defended in a tract, as you might say, a book that was not published in the time, but only a few years later, the author pulled a chapter out and called it the freedom of the seas, the freedom of navigation. It's a classic of international law today, and its author is Hugo Grotius, one of the great forefathers of international law. He had, as a young man, been put on to this case to defend it. I presume the directors wanted a 20-page pamphlet going on against the Portuguese, how terrible and nasty they are and that they deserved everything that they got. What they didn't expect was 236 folio pages in Latin on the laws of war and peace, which he did in fact write. But this is his first major engagement with the laws of war and peace. And it is a case that happened right out here in front of our back door or behind me here huh? off Changi. Now, the Portuguese were miffed. You can imagine losing a cargo that size. The governor of Malacca at the time was at the end of his tenure, and he wasn't too interested in taking up this case anymore. He had his eyes set on something else. He's a descendant of Albuquerque. His forefather had taken Malacca in 1511. His name is Fernão de Albuquerque. Huh? And needless to say, who he is related to. His successor is a man by the name of Andre Furtado de Mendoza. Now, Furtado de Mendoza is an accomplished warrior and a very great admiral. He had proven himself, and he's the new governor of Malacca. And he decides he's going to teach those Johorians a lesson. And he's the one who decides to impose first to, to, to raise the temperatures huh, politically with an escalation of violence, coastal raiding that finds an apex first in a massacre of uh, about 50 odd merchants from Malacca in the capital city, Batusawar. It's in the Jacques de Coutre book. He was there when it happened. And then he imposes a blockade on the Johor River right at the time that the ships are beginning to come in from China and Japan. 
Here, uh, on this particular image, you have the 1604 pamphlet, one year after it happened, 1604 pamphlet announcing the seizure of the Santa Catarina. What a fantastic uh, prize this was, prize of war. Now, again, you have three Dutch ships, smaller ones, attacking a very large Portuguese vessel. And in the background, you have um, what looks to be uh, the Johor Navy or ships of the Johor Navy uh, in the background there. And the town, I assume, is pure imagination again, as are the mountains in the background. All right. So who won? Well, it depends on how you look at it, and it depends on who you read. If you read the Dutch source, of course, they claim that they won. Did anybody really win? That's, that's probably a much better question. The answer is, in the short term, yes, they scared the Portuguese away. And we know from the text that what vessels of those small prahus actually survived. They were assembled in shallow waters off the northern coast of ba uh, Batam. Uh, and when they saw the Dutch the next morning heading in their direction, they said, oh, let's get out of here, and, and, and set sail and moved on. And of course, the Dutch can't stay. They have to move on too. And a few weeks or a few days after the Dutch have left, uh, they, they come back and put the, the naval blockade in force again, and so. In reality, the Dutch didn't win. They might have won the skirmish, but they basically had the upper hand because they had a permanent presence in Malacca. What are the repercussions? Well, the repercussions we know back in Europe have to do with international law. It has to do with with uh, the Portuguese here beefing up security. They're saying, we can't let this happen again. They were so used to local type of warfare that they didn't really think about a European enemy with heavy artillery showing up and blasting them to pieces. And so they had to change their tactic. They had to put more bigger vessels into their fleets. To the Dutch, they're becoming aware that yes, Johor is our friend, but yes, they got a lot of problems too. They are very vulnerable. They're very vulnerable to famines. If you cut off all supplies coming upriver, the people will probably starve to death, most of them anyway. The defenses were not particularly very good, and they are simply too close to Portuguese Malacca for comfort. Johor also took the consequences. Uh, they said, good, uh, now we have somebody who will help us against the Portuguese, excellent. Uh, let's move. It's not quite as simple as that. There are many people at the court in Batu Sawar who are making lots of money trading with the Portuguese. Don't kid yourself, they are big business with the Portuguese. But there's also a faction developing that wants to do business with the Dutch. And you can see that this is not going to end happily, and it didn't. What does this episode tell us about Singapore? That's really an important question. I think we can say that Singapore is an important nodal point at this stage. In the age of sail, it is a very important transitional point and recognized as such between two very active and very busy maritime zones. It becomes the favorite hunting ground of Dutch patrols, naval squadrons, that regularly patrol the waters of the Straits. They like to put him right there in the Johor River estuary off, off Changi, 
to guard there and also what goes through the, the Riau Strait between Batam and Bintan. And the other favorite location for cruising is just off the northern side of Karibun. And that's their second favorite place because there you can watch all the traffic coming through here, going up through the southern Malacca Strait and then heading down the Strait of Kundur uh, and the Durian Strait uh, in the direction of Java and that would also be the route for the ships heading out to the Moluccas, to the Spice Islands. So it's an important nodal point and they rob vessels here regularly under the laws of war. They're not technically pirates, but it's robbery nevertheless. And it's not the only naval battles. The 1603 naval battle is only one, and there are two in the year 1603. You have the one we just dealt with, with Admiral Peters and Tejeda de Macedo, and of course you have earlier in February the incident involving the Santa Catarina. Now off the bat, I came up with about seven in a period of 100 years alone, and these are significant ones, not small ones. We have one around 1514. This is a Portuguese raid on Singapore. Uh, we don't have many documents relating to this, but we know that the Laksamana of uh, Malacca had put his residence here on Singapore. Uh, the 16, uh, sorry, 1513, the um, fugitive Malacca Sultan is living on Singapore, and this probably gave a boost to the port, and the Portuguese decided we're going to go and take this place out. So it is mentioned that they destroyed Singapore, or burnt it down, uh, around this period. The second one is in the 1530s when they have the wars with Bintan and they're doing uh, a couple of raids up the Johor River. This is under uh, the Ga da Gama expedition. 1577 is the map you see here. Uh, I would have, I would have uh, had my own image of this, a high resolution image, but unfortunately I'm told in Lisbon that the manuscript is being restored and I am not able to have a copy until the restoration work is finished, so I had to pinch it from somebody else and the, uh, the blog side is down there. This relates to uh, um, another campaign uh, off Changi there. You can see Tekong Besar uh, uh, as B. Huh? D would be Singapore and number three is uh, Pulau Bin. Huh? That's another episode. Then we have the 1587 campaign uh, up the Johor River by uh, Lima de Pereira. And then there are two in the year 1603. And then finally, the mighty Spanish Armada shows up in the year 1616. The biggest fleet ever seen, European fleet ever seen in the East Indies until that day shows up off the coast of Singapore and anchors here for two months. This will be the topic, as you will hear, of another paper of mine very soon. If we look at the bigger picture, there are other things happening here. The Dutch are initially very interested in this part of the region. They are thinking of establishing a permanent base. This, this idea of coming out here for on a nine or a ten month voyage yeah, and, and sitting around and waiting for cargoes to, to or harvests to ripen uh, just was not a very viable business proposition. So they said, now what we need, we need a permanent base in Asia. Well, where should this base be? And this is something that one of the successors uh, of 1603, uh, this was Admiral Motleaf, shows up in 1606, signs two treaties with Johor, and on his way home he's thinking about where should we put our headquarters in Asia. Initially, they were thinking about something around here, and believe it or not, they're discussing Singapore as late as 1610. Uh, 1610, they're still discussing Singapore as a possible location 
for the VOC Asian headquarters, Dutch East India Company. But gradually, the attention is moving southwards to Java for a number of reasons. Food supplies and access from Europe all year round were key behind the choice to go near the Sunda Strait. And for those of you who are interested in this, uh, it's, it's in uh, my little, and the big Motley booklet in particular. But the Dutch do have an interest in this area. Even though they go down to Batavia, now Jakarta, they go there and establish their main Asian base there. They maintain an interest in, in this region because they know that this is an important commercial artery. And they still continue to have the patrols very active in this part uh, of Southeast Asia, well beyond the 1640s. Is this worthy of remembering in the history books? I would say yes. I think it is. But I think we also need to contextualize it within the bigger context, as I have tried to do in the last 15 to 20 minutes. It is part of a much larger geostrategic deliberation that is being made by the early European colonial powers. They are aware Singapore definitely shows up on their radar screen. In fact, they are variously making uh, proposals to build fortifications in the Straits rather than having to rely on these mobile fleets. The Dutch do it, the Portuguese do it, the English are thinking about doing it in Karimun in the 17th century. Singapore is not a neglected place. It's not a forgotten place at all. It has a functioning port. It has a shabandar or a portmaster, and it seems to be a pretty happening place. It also seems to be, from all I've seen in these documents, to be one of the bases, if not the major base, of the Johor Armada. So the fleet of Johor is based here in Singapore in the 17th century and in the 16th as well. Singapore is well charted, well known, well known because the straits are very dangerous and because it was so dangerous you have lots of descriptions and lots of navigational instructions about the things that you need to worry about when you pass through the straits so it shows up it's not forgotten it's very very much on the radar screen of everyone including the locals and the early colonial powers and this is not just imagination. We have other testimonies that will absolutely underscore everything that I have said so far. And you can find them there uh, in the back in some of these document collections that I have been producing over the last few years. You have Jacques de Coutre attesting to a very good port on Singapore. And you have Motley saying that he personally met the Shabandar of Singapore. So these people must exist, and something must be happening. Singapore is not a forgotten place. Not at this point in time. So you may ask me, what are you working on now? I'm now working on the Spanish Armada in Singapore. This is going to be the topic of another paper on the 28th of April, uh, organized by the Friends of the Museum at the Asian Civilizations Museum. Very important episode. It's surprisingly well documented. And the reason it is well documented is because it was such a fiasco, a fiasco, and it was so expensive. And when the viceroy in Mexico City, who had to pay for the fleet, got the final report, he just about hit the ceiling. Yeah? He said, somebody is going to have to stand for this. 
They pretty much threw everybody into prison who had survived this uh, ordeal off the coast of Singapore. And one by one, they were interviewing them in, in signed and sworn affidavits, uh, which I have been busy transcribing and translating uh, over the last few months. I reckon it could be another 12 to 18 months to see the final product, depending on how fast I can work and how fast the university press will see this through. And with this, ladies and gentlemen, I think I will rest my case. And if there's anything you would like to ask me, I open the floor to questions. Thank you for your attention.